Welcome to the edition of Boxing Info, I'm your host, The Islander, and this is the results show week ending November the 28th. A couple things in the news real quick, and I don't want to stretch this out to be 45 minutes again, and that is revisiting Pacquiao thing, because there's a couple of people, of course, you know, when you put Pacquiao and Margarito or Pacquiao in your, your, your tags, this and that, it's going to attract all sorts of different visitors to, to the page. Obviously, none of them understand the context of the show from its evolution and more importantly a lot of these people don't have a good command of the English language so let me clarify something and I still have not yet to see or rewind even have a tape of this but when Manny Pacquiao was coming to the ring against Margarito I could swear I'm not 100% certain I'm about 95% certain I heard Max Kellerman say that Pacquiao was amazing he won seven titles in seven different weight seven different weight classes by old school standards he had won four in the original eight weight classes and I swear that he said that those were the linear ones and they were linear ones at that was his exact words here's the deal I am not arguing the eight weight different weight divisions it's a fact I'm not arguing that he's won four linear titles 112 flyweight 126 featherweight, 130 junior lightweight, and 140 over Ricky Hatton, the junior welterweight. My contention is, and I will stand by it, it's that he has not won linear titles in four of the original eight weight classes, which are flyweight, bantamweight, featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight. Those are the eight original weight classes. Pacquiao has won four linear titles, just not in four of those original eight. If you don't understand English, you don't understand that I'm not going to go lick his feet. This show and this video is not for you. Get lost. Okay, enough of that. Some interesting news, though. Uh, Pay-per-view numbers are out for this fight. And here's an article on ESPN by Dan Raphael and says Manny Pacquiao already holds the record for winning titles in eight weight classes. Now he has tied a record in the pay-per-view world. All you Mayweather nut huggers, step aside, this isn't about you. Pacquiao matched former heavyweight champ Mike Tyson as the only fighter in pay-per-view history to generate at least one million buys for a fight in three consecutive years. HBO announced Tuesday that Pacquiao's one-sided battering of Antonio Margarito on November 13th at Cowboy Stadium to win the vacant junior middleweight title, his record-extending eighth, generated at least 1.15 million buys and 64 million domestic pay-per-view revenue, meaning the United States. The number HBO reportedly is only an initial figure, with the total likely to rise once the buys are fully accounted for. Uh, we're thrilled, blah, 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 blah. Pacquiao's lopsided eighth round destruction of Oscar De La Hoya, which sent him into retirement, generated 1.25 million buys in 2008. Pacquiao's 12th round knockout of Miguel Cotto in 2009 sold 1.2 million units. This is the third consecutive year that a Manny Pacquiao mega fight has exceeded 1 million buys, and he has generated 5.1 million buys over his last five fights. True measures of his pay-per-view superstar status, Mark Taffet of HBO was quoted as saying. Pacquiao's other 2010 fight, a lopsided decision against Joshua Clotty at Cowboy Stadium in March, generated 700,000 buys. That fight was made on short notice and Clotty was a virtual unknown. Their words, not mine. Okay. Regardless of that, results this past weekend. Well, the big one, obviously, was the middleweight title rematch at a catchweight of 158 pounds between champ linear WBC, WBO middleweight champion Sergio Martinez of Argentina against Paul Williams, Paul the Punisher Williams. The result was one that I would never have expected, and... I was expecting the decision to go one way or the other in a, in a very tight, tightly contested match. And what ended up happening is, midway through the first round, the thing about Martinez, and I sold him short a, a year or so ago, is that he must have studied the movements of Paul Williams because you could tell midway through the first round that he started changing the angle at which he started throwing his left hand. 
and for the first half of the first round, he really wasn't landing that flushly on Williams. The second half, and I should say the last minute of the first round, he started basically coming over the top with his left hand, uh, more of an overhand left as opposed to the, sh the straight left. Uh, Die all day asked me on my channel what was the difference between a left hook and a left cross. It's very simple. A left hook is thrown from an orthodox stance, the fighter with their left foot forward, the right-handed fighter, and it's, more, it's from the lead hand, hooked around obviously, you know what that is. A left cross is thrown from, a, is thrown from the southpaw stance, the fighter with their right foot forward, and it's thrown more straight and turned over and across the body. It's not a hook out of that stance, and that's not what that punch was. That punch was an overhand left. Williams, whose defense has always been questionable, finally paid the price for it. And the thing about this is, is that this is Sergio Martinez is probably going to win Fighter of the Year, and I think he should, uh, with wins over Pavlik and over Williams, coupled with the fact that. This is going to be the knockout of the year. There's nothing, I don't think, even remotely close to the championship level. It is the knockout of the year. Looking at the replays of the knockout, Williams was moving into the power of Martinez, and at the same time Martinez launched that punch, he wasn't even looking at where the punch was being thrown. Because if you look at the slow motion replays, his eyes are fixed past Williams, and he wasn't even, wasn't even looking at Williams when he hit him. Uh, very reminiscent of when Michael Nunn knocked out Sumbu Kalambe with one left hand. They Both guys came at each other with their eyes closed in that instance, not this one. And Nunn wasn't even looking at Kalambe when he landed that punch. Same situation here. Williams down face first, eyes wide open, basically paralyzed. Uh, there were reports that this was a left hook. It was not. It was an overhand left. There were reports that... Uh, Morton or Cotton, whoever the referee was, waved the fight off without a count. That is not the case. I heard him count nine and wave his hands. The, the, the thing was that the doctors got into the ring right as he was finishing the count, at least from what I saw. This is obviously another career-defining fight for Martinez, and with that there is very little else for him to, for him to basically pursue. What are the options? And this is going to tie back into Pacquiao now because there are people calling for a fight between he and Pacquiao. Listen, the days of the catchweights, that, that crap's over. If Pacquiao would like to, if they want to make this fight and Pacquiao wants to come in at 147, Martinez has every, has every right to come in at 160. He's the champion of the middleweight division, one of the original eight weight classes. I don't care how unfair it is or this or that. Either make the fight at the real weight or don't make it at all. That, that's my sense in this. That, that fight's probably not going to happen. Just let's be clear about it. What everybody is also forgetting, all the journalists, and I'm not sure about HBO because I don't even listen to what they say. Martinez, I believe, has a had a clause. Kelly Pavlik has a clause in which I think Martinez owes him a rematch. I think, you know, not much is probably going to change from the first fight. Although I think that if one of them's going to improve. It's going to be Pavlik from the first fight, not Martinez. Martinez is at the top of his game right now. It'd be interesting. It's not going to generate, uh, you know, any type of pay-per-view extravaganza. The fact of the matter is that Pavlik travels well, or he has traveled well to Atlantic City and draws a, a, a big crowd is one reason for that fight. Other than that, if Arthur Abraham or one of the other middleweights that was fighting in the super middleweight tournament actually drops back down the middleweight. I would like to see a fight between Arthur Abraham and, and Sergio Martinez. Um, and that's pretty much, there was some other fights, but not ones that I would uh, I mentioned or wanted to keep track of. With that said, as we approach the 10 minute mark now, uh, the thing with Pacquiao and the future opponents, I want to delve into this uh, news about Bernard Hopkins making these comments that Pacquiao's never fought a, African a slick African-American fighter and he'd probably lose the Mayweather. Bernard Hopkins, please enlighten all of us. How many world-class African-American boxers are there in the 108-pound division, the 112-pound division, the 122-pound division, the 126-pound division, the 130-pound division, the 135-pound division? And I know you can spew out Nate Campbell's name, but look, 
his name didn't garner the kind of buys that you know somebody like Marquez would would generate. And it's just that that's why he didn't, he didn't get the fight. He's trying to follow Pacquiao up to junior welterweight, and he's looked horrendous in two fights. Now, with that said, what is left in the welterweight division? And I'm going to play devil's advocate, okay, and say, okay, Pacquiao hasn't fought any African American fighters. Big whoop. He's fought fighters from real Africa, but neither here nor there. Two fights have been thrown out there at welterweight for him. Mosley and Berto. Those of you who have asked me on my comments about this. Listen, I say make the fights. I say make the fights. I think Pacquiao wins both of them easy, and both of them going away. Mosley couldn't catch up to Sergio Mora. You, all of you people around the world have read too much into Mosley's fight against Margarito. Margarito was worn out by Cotto, worn out by Cintron, and, and, and it showed in Mosley's last two fights that he was basically in there with a punching bag when he was in there with Margarito. He wasn't ready to fight, he didn't, they, his people didn't want the fight, and you're reading way too much into that. So Pacquiao against Mosley, uh, Pacquiao wins going away. Maybe Pacquiao even stops Mosley, I don't know. Uh, Mosley is not good at basically boxing off his back foot, as some of you would say. He he, he cannot be the play the passive aggressive game. It's the aggressive game it, it, at, at a slower pace, is what it is. Kind of, it, it's just not it's not in the cards. Berto, way too inexperienced. Uh, two instances in which Southpaws have hurt him really bad. Luis Colazo at the end of the first round of their fight. Basically, it should have been a knockdown when he knocked, when he knocked Berto down into the ropes. And rewind even before his title days against Cosme Rivera. Cosme Rivera was being outboxed by Berto and outpunched. He switches to the southpaw stance in the 7th or 8th round, lands a left uppercut, down goes Berto hard. Okay, here's the deal. Not a good fight. And I'm absolutely positive Pacquiao stops Andre Berto probably before the ninth round. I'm almost, I mean, I'm not 100% sure of it. But my gut tells me it's not a fight that lasts the distance. The Mosley thing, that could last the distance. He's savvy, but Pacquiao wins both those fights for different reasons. One, because Mosley can't catch up with him. And the other one, because Berto, who can catch up with him, has a, has, has a defense that's a little bit better than Paul Williams, but still it's penetrable by the southpaw. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's go ahead and make those fights. Make them in, in, in three-month increments. Maybe we'll get one for free on HBO. I don't know. But that, that's that. Uh, I would like to see Pacquiao kind of stay in, uh, stay at 147, or even migrate back down to 140, and and get in the mix with Amir Khan and and Maidana and uh, Alexander and Bradley. I mean, I think there is enough, maybe not to generate a pay per view, a million dollar, a million buy pay per view type extravaganza, but at least to make really good, exciting fights. All right, let's go to some things that are coming up as we approach now a little over 13 minutes. This weekend, on Showtime, from Oakland, California, what else is new with Andre Wood, huh? Northern California again. Andre Wood taking on Saki Obika for the WBA Super Middleweight title. It's also quasi part of the Super 6 tournament because Wood has enough points now. He's already into the I, I guess into the finals. I, I'm not keeping up with this because it, it's just it's it's just ridiculous. I mean to me, but that's going to be an interesting test for for Ward. I expect Ward to come through and win a decision. But Abika has had a revi has revitalized his career in, with that contender show, and I expect Bika, I expect Ward to have some anxious moments. Let's put it that way. I'll, I'll put it to you that way, and I expect him to scrape. This fight should resemble Joe Calzaghe's fight with uh, with Saki Obika. I, would I be shocked if Bika pulls off the upset? No, but it's highly unlikely. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to, definitely going to be interesting. All right. Also in Helsinki, Finland, and I think Hitman Conan or one of you guys is going to this live, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's not Hitman. It's somebody else. I keep getting some of the names mixed up. One of, one of, one of the subscribers and the regulars on this program is going to this fight. Super 6, Group Stage 3, Carl Frosch, Arthur Abraham, 12 rounds for the vacant WBC Super Middleweight title. I guess this is, this is going to be Kessler's title who, uh, that they're, they're going to be fighting for. 
Uh, interesting fight. If they each fight the way they have been fighting, Abraham should win this fight. If Rush reverts back to the rough housing tactics that he used against Darrell and lets his hands go like he did against Jermaine Taylor, he's definitely in the fight. He fights like he did against Kessler. I don't want to hear any more sour grapes. Look, Abraham is going to punch within the, in those wide shots, and it, it, it could, this could be a real stinker of a fight. Just let me let you, because both of these guys are hesitant, and they both have dynamic ability, knockout ability, and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it, I, I, I'm going with Abraham, and I think probably by a decision, a, a closer than comfortable decision. I don't see Frosch getting to him and knocking him out, and I don't see Abraham, you know, Abraham, I guess, could score the stoppage, but I, I, I would guess more on a, on a wide decision. Okay, next uh, order of merit here, Las Vegas on HBO. I believe three of these fights are being shown on HBO. I thought I had read that. It may have changed. Celestine Caballero taking on Jason Litzow, 10-round junior lightweight uh, fight. I'm expecting Caballero to run through Litzow. Uh, it'll be interesting for, it, or competitive maybe for a round or two, and then Caballero's going to pull away and probably stop Litzow. I'd be surprised if there's any other result. Okay, Andre Berto, the man in question, again, whose name's being thrown around that he's chasing Pacquiao around, taking on Freddy Hernandez, 12 rounds. Berto, I mean, wide decision, middle to late round stoppage, Berto. Look, the thing is, he's being fed a steady diet of what I would call B and C rated boxers. Uh, when he's been in deep water before against um, against other fighters, I, I mean, he's looked vulnerable. And my thinking is, this is just a stay busy kind of fight. I've read that Lou DiBella has said that if they can't get Pacquiao, they're gonna, if they can't get Pacquiao, they're gonna go after Mosley in the snap. Look. That would be fine with me, and I'd be fine with Pacquiao fighting the winner of Mosley and Berto. I'd be fine with that. But I think that they think this guy is better than he really is, and I'm just keeping it real. He hasn't proved nothing to me. I mean, that's just just way, and a lot of it is not his fault. It's the fact they can't get fights for him. Uh, but he is the one who backed out of the Mosley fight. It, that would have been you know a unification fight between WBA and WBC champion because of that earthquake stuff. Um, I. You know, to me, I would basically just put that on hold for like six weeks and, and, and you know, got that fight done before Mosley jumped ship in Fort Mayweather. Um, Berto's going to win this fight. The main event, Juan Manuel Marquez versus Michael Katsidis. Michael Katsidis has suffered a tragedy in his family. His brother, who was a, a thoroughbred jockey, died. They said the show's still going to go on. I wonder how much that's going to affect him. But the thing is, this is, with all things being equal and both guys fighting at the top of their powers, this is the full-fledged, irrepressible force coming at the counter-punching sharpshooter. What is going to break down first, Katsidi's skin and chin or Marquez's legs? I'm of the belief that Marquez is a small lightweight and his punch is not the same as it was at featherweight or junior lightweight. With that said, and even though they fought a common opponent in Joel Casamayor and had opposite, you know, Marquez stopped Casamayor, Casamayor stopped Katsidis. Katsidis looked better in the middle of that fight, not the beginning and not the end, than Marquez did except for the end of his fight with Casamayor. He looked old and slow in that fight, and my thinking is this, when they start to rumble, it's all Katsidis, because if Katsidis fights the way he did in the middle of the Casamayor fight, my gut tells me it's him. He could get cut up and stopped. I'm going to actually go out on a limb here and go with the underdog and say I'm taking Katsidis in this fight. I don't think that Marquez, based on his slick counter-punching ability and sharpshooting, it's going to be enough to keep Katsidis off of him. If Juan Diaz was able to crowd him and hurt him, Katsidis is going to do worse to him. Now, could Katsidis be cut up and stopped in five rounds? Yeah. 
Do I expect Marquez to really hurt him bad? No. I hope that Cassidy's learned from the Casamayo fight, but if he didn't, he's in for a rough night. I'm going with Cassidy's in this fight, and you know obviously how I expect it to end if, he, if I pick him to win. That's going to do it for this edition of Boxing Info. Um, stay tuned, we'll be back with some results and some more previews on Mir Khan and Marcos Maidana's right around the corner. Thanks everybody.